words, we first experience the emotion of the word, the rhythm, the patterns of the sounds, and only after that does the front of the brain unpack what it means. The limbic system does the emotions, the postcentral gyrus does the rhythms and the patterns, and the frontal lobe unpacks the meaning. So when I read today's passage and when it was read before, the emotional timbre that you personally ascribe to words rain, dew, gentle, tender, grass, shower, herb, were all recognized before you actually knew what the words meant. And because so many emotionally laden words came to you so quickly and so much distance was separated from them from the subject of the sentence, your limbic system, unless you're a heartless cyborg, which, yeah, maybe, became saturated. It literally stole the show. And the meaning of the words took backstage to the emotional imprint of the words, as well as the rhythmic portrait that together they painted. Poetry. Unfortunately, we most often learn poetry from English teachers who seem bound and determined to focus on the software rather than the more interesting hardware issues. Or maybe that's just because I'm a nurse. But maybe it would have been better if we had all learned about poetry from our PE teachers or even the school nurse. So here's a simple definition that I think will stand up pretty, pretty well compared to the books on poetry and the definitions you may have heard. Poetry is any language that seeks to overcome the tyranny of the frontal lobe by overstimulation of the limbic system and the post-central gyrus. Poetry is any language that seeks to overcome the tyranny of the frontal lobe by overstimulation of the limbic system and the post-central gyrus. In the simplest of terms, the brain can be divided between the academic centers in the front and the athletic centers in the back. And yes, the Greeks were correct. Poetry is most definitely an athletic activity. But let's take a closer look at that phrase I used at the beginning of my definition of poetry. The tyranny of the frontal lobe. When did the frontal lobe accrue so much power in our minds? Well, it had its beginnings in the Greek taxonomy of education. Because once divided, once a taxonomy, whatever taxonomy becomes ingrained, degrees of value are then Ascribe. This is true in terms of race or gender, in everything, including cranial lobes. And after Greece, the front and the back of the brain would never be viewed as equals again. Learning that happened in the front half of the brain slowly became more valued, probably for a financial gain the learning that arose from the back half. And in time, this created scholasticism and the European Enlightenment, and finally the experiment called modernity. Modernity, which in turn gave the genetic materials to that most rational of all religious traditions, Presbyterians, <laughs> right? And that, my dearly beloved, my dearly, dearly beloved, that is why 
this tradition of ours is dying. And that is why we need poetry. The modern experiment has failed. The plight which our planet finds itself in environmentally, racially, politically, is the result of the failed venture called modernity. And so as a species, we are searching for a postmodern mythology, a way to live beyond the simply rational. And as a part of that, a great hunger has arisen to break down the walls between the front and the back halves of our brains. We long to discover the unity that once existed. And that is why athletic religions, the ones that embrace rhythm and pattern, emotion and movement over simple meaning, are thriving. And why, as I said, we Presbyterians are dying. Just shy of 20 years ago, I bought my first Islamic prayer rug. I gave it to my son. He was at that age where going to church had become boring for him, but he enjoyed mirroring me as together we stood facing Mecca and the shrine of Adam and Eve and sang out in poor Arabic the call to prayer and bent over and stood and prostrated and kneeled. And we would recite psalms as we did it, especially the one about honey and cinnamon. And when done, we would run our fingers through the mandalas we had made of them. On Fridays, I would pick him up from daycare early and together Covered in flour, we would roll out the challah for Shabbat. And in the dark mornings, still though he has long moved away, I light my candle and lay out my prayer rug and go through the motions and whisper the prayers so as not to disturb my wife. And when I'm at the university, I go to Catholic Mass at noon. I like the kneeling, the words which are always exactly the same. I like the feel of beads in my fingers when with closed eyes I run through the rosary. And when I go forward and the priest touches my forehead in blessing, I go back to the pew and I move that blessing. Through each of the chakra points. And most Sundays, like I did this morning at 830, I go to Orthos of the Greek Orthodox Church. And I stand for an hour for the chanting of a liturgy I cannot understand a word of and wait for the priest to walk by and bathe me in incense. Why do I do these things? I don't know. In fact, I try hard not to think, not to explain even to myself my motivations. I do them because the church in the back of my brain comes alive in the rhythms and the patterns of a diverse faith life I have created for myself. I guess I do so that I might come to God freely outside the tyrannical control of my frontal lobe. And I am not alone. Even as we Presbyterians shrink, Islam and Hinduism and Orthodoxy are seeing resurgences. In the 1700s, Saint Anselm, 
change the world by proclaiming that faith must seek understanding. The only real faith he claimed is one that is rational. But now his words seem steeped in colonialism, seem outdated, misguided. We Presbyterians will never be like the traditions of long patterns of relishing the truth discovered in the back of our brains. But, but, we can discover our own path to a postmodern church. And we are. Indications show that across our denomination, that path, when ventured upon, is most solidly built on poetry. Poetry is becoming our gateway to the church in the back of our brains. Liz, I'm grateful for the invitation you gave me, especially since I kind of begged it out of you, so didn't give you a lot of choice, I must say. But you're kind and forgiving. <laughs> Take pity on me. Over the next three weeks, I look forward to walking with you to the church in the back of your brains. You know it. It's never completely gone away, right? The church where the young child waits, where the hymn tune carries you, where candles in the dark of Christmas Eve flicker, and the cries he has risen echo within. The church beyond simple meaning, the church where the frontal lobe is escaped and the heart becomes strangely warm. The church where the gift of poetry waits to be embodied. Amen. <laughs>